once more. Uh, let's read from Isaiah 65 and verse 17. Isaiah 65 and verse 17. And it says this, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard no more. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for your great presence with us. We start in a tent, we end in a new Jerusalem. We start in the most holy place, we will end in the most holy city of God. Help us as we continue our look at this tabernacle. Uh, may our worship be acceptable to you, we pray for the glory of your name. Amen. Let's sing. O thou. in whose presence we'd like to turn to uh, Exodus 27 and once again we're not going to read the whole chapter uh, although I encourage you to read it when uh, you're at home Exodus 27 build an altar of acacia wood 
three cubits high. It is to be square, five cubits long and five cubits wide. Make a horn at each of the four corners, so that the horns and the altar are of one piece, and overlay the altar with bronze. Make all its utensils of bronze, its pots to remove the ashes, and its shovels, sprinkling bowls, meat forks and firepans. Make a grating for it, a bronze network, and make... You're going to have to excuse me, my uh, tablet is playing up today, so continue, continue from verse 2. Make a, a horn at each of the four corners, so that the horns of the altar are of one piece. And overlay the altar with bronze. Make all its utensils with bronze. Its pots to remove the ashes, its shovels, sprinkling bowls, meat forks and fire pans. I think I read that, didn't I? Make a grating for it, a bronze network and make a bronze ring at the corner of the four corners of the network. Put it under the ledge of the altar so that it is halfway up the altar. Make poles of acacia wood for the altar and overlay them with bronze. The poles are to be inserted into the ring so that they will be on two sides of the altar when it is carried. Make the altar hollow out of the board. It is to be made just as you were shown on the mountain. And then if you just jump down to verse 20, verse 20. Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives uh, for the light so that the, the lamps may be kept burning. In the tent of meeting, in, outside the curtain, that is the front of the testimony, Aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before the Lord from evening till morning. This is to be a lasting ordinance among the Israelites for the generations to come. My apologies that I've switched to my mobile phone rather than my tablet, which is um, to my side here. I'll just see how that goes. Anyway. So we continue in our journey as we seek to understand the tabernacle, this strange tent that the Israelites were commanded to make during their time in the wilderness. And it lasted for about 400 years. I suspect over time repairs would have been made on the, the various coverings, uh, but otherwise it was pretty much the same, certainly everything inside, until David wanted to build something more permanent, although it was his son Solomon who would actually build the temple. And God made it clear that this was the way, at this stage of redemption story, for God to dwell with man. It was a tent, because it was movable, and eventually a temple, although on two occasions it was destroyed, the final time being the, the Romans in AD 70, devastating for the Jews, uh, even to this day, uh, but completely missing that the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the one to whom this all points and has fulfilled all the purposes for the uh, for the temple. If you remember, we've erected furniture, the Ark of the Covenant, the table for the bread of the presence, we put that together, uh, and then the lampstand. Then last week we were putting tents up with uh, home furnishings, perhaps, curtains in particular that we focused on with those cherubim in, 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 uh, uh, sewed onto them. And now we move outdoors, and it's not a garden, but it's a courtyard, with, I guess, following the theme, if you want to stick with this, uh, of home design, we could call it a barbecue. But of course, a lot more serious than a barbecue would ever be. And firstly, we start with one of those two items of furniture, the altar. Now, I've never belonged to any church other than a church uh, like the one we currently belong to, um, what we call the nonconformist. For various historical reasons, we nonconformist churches broke away from the Church of England churches, which in turn broke away from the Roman Catholic Church, courtesy of Henry VIII. Um, now, we haven't had time to, to, to look into why this morning, but if you go into a Church of England or a Roman Catholic Church, they will often have at the front what they call an altar. And if I'm correct, this is where they share either the, the communion or, or, the, or the mass, uh, but it's, it's misleading. And actually, it's it's plain wrong. Uh, we we have a table at our church, but we could use one of the go-pack tables out of the back if we wanted. We could rest it on a chair. It wouldn't matter. Uh, an altar is for dead things, for sacrifice. 
And that's what we're looking at today. When the book of Hebrews was written, the temple was still standing. So we read in Hebrews 10, uh, talking about the current situation, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly, repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Now, of course, you know, Christ died on the cross, the, the temple veil was torn in two. I'm sure they either replaced it or, or sewed it together. Uh, but it was finished. There was still an altar there. Uh, it was still used. Uh, but they missed it. We read, uh, but when Christ, in, in Hebrews, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, indicating his work was done. So we don't need an altar in our churches and it's misleading when Christians speak of one. Uh, now, as with last week, it's a difficult passage to preach through as I would normally preach through. Because in essence, it's, it's another set of instructions for us to put the thing together. Now, this altar was probably about seven foot by seven foot, about four foot high, uh, probably about half the distance between uh, the tent with its rooms and the entrance. Plunked there. I don't know how heavy it was, whether it came apart to carry. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure it's, it's there somewhere. But as you, the thing is, as you would enter this courtyard, aware that the place where God met with man was there in front of you, but your view will immediately be drawn to this bronze altar in front of you, or in front of it. We saw uh, that uh, those uh, rooms in the tent were gold. The bases of the curtains surrounding the courtyard were bronze. The clips holding the curtains together were silver and this altar is bronze. It's as if the further you are from God, the less precious the metals are. And of course, as you enter, you're reminded of many things, but not least that sin is a huge problem. Remember, last week we had cherubim uh, blocking the way, stitched into those curtains. But now we have this huge altar, which is burning dead things you would smell it probably throughout the camp at times sin is a huge problem we went back to uh, genesis last week let's return there again i have said this before but repetition can be a good thing uh, in eden adam and eve we read that the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame after they sinned they rightly felt shame and tried to cover up that nakedness. So they in some way sewed fig leaves together. Was it using vines? I don't know. Uh, to cover up that nakedness. But as we saw last week, they were driven out from the garden. But before doing, we read this one line. And it's an important line. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now, God could have just made skin, couldn't he? Just like that. Uh, he could have made great durable garments from them. Um, f from the skin he had just made. Just as he made Adam's skin. I made Adam. Of course he could do that. But to think that way is to miss the point. These garments uh, were second hand. An animal had been wearing them uh, moments earlier. And he had to die. Probably two animals. Possibly two of the very animals that Adam had named earlier in the chapter. And now they're dead. Blood shed to cover over their sin. They're to blame. Uh, sorry, sorry, they are to blame, but these animals die in their place. They live for another thousand years. Uh, substitution is at the heart of the gospel. Where originally an animal died in the place of the sinner, uh, ultimately the substitute will be Christ, who dies in my place as an offering for my sin. And, and that's actually the bronze altar for you. I think what would happen is that you would enter the courtyard with your animal, the priests would check it for anything that 
uh, would make it unfit any blemish uh, of of some sort and I think what would happen is that you would kill the animal now I think that's right I haven't been able to get a clear answer on that um, but you would click, slit the animal's throat um, I seem grim uh, the animal rights activist would be so offended of course but here's the thing it's your fault there's no one else to blame you've sinned as the Bible tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. This is what happens when you offend the most holy God. Something dies. And can you see it? Can you see where this is pointing? Calvary. We look to the cross for our forgiveness of sins. That's where we obtain true forgiveness. Because we have a substitute. We read again in Hebrews but those sacrifices, uh, talking about the, the, the temple sacrifices, uh, are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So basically, all those animals never actually forgave one sin. They just pointed to Jesus. Wouldn't church be messy if we had to still sacrifice? Messy and smoky because sin is messy. But we don't because of where this all points to, our Saviour. Now just one more comment on this section and it's verse 3 really. Make all the utensils out of bronze. I think we'll get there in the end but I wanted to just mention it now. When these things were made and the temple was established, uh, they were all, all, everything was anointed with a special oil. And they were set apart for God's use. If you've ever had a coal fire, you'll know how these tools uh, that you have to that you have to stoke it to clear out the ashes soon get battered and black. Uh, and what would have happened is that these tools, <coughs> sorry, that would have happened to these tools, but but they were set apart for special use. You couldn't borrow a spade, uh, take it home. Sorry, Aaron, can I just have this spade overnight? I'll, I'll bring it back to dig your garden. <coughs> Not that they had gardens, but even though uh, it could do the job perfectly well, it was set apart. It was holy. It was consecrated. That's another word. Uh, and here's the thing. So are we. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 reminds us, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God, you're not your own. You were born at a price, therefore glorify God with your body. A helpful reminder that if we are trusted in God, we belong to him for his use only. Let's move on. Let's look at the uh, courtyard, which we didn't read, verses 9 to 19. I think I said somewhere a few weeks back of it being about half the size of a football pitch. Uh, about four tennis courts, something like that. So it's not a small thing. Uh, the area was surrounded by 60 bases with a pillar stuck in each base and from these uh, uh, and from these huge white linen curtains. And I guess they were uh, probably ropes perhaps to, to secure it all, but huge white linen curtains. We don't get all the details, but Moses had seen all the details on the mountain and these curtains were about eight feet tall so you couldn't just look over uh, interestingly the entrance always faced the east which was the same as the entrance to eden although i don't know what the significance of that is except that there is this is like a copy like a mini eden in some way but there was only one way in not two ways not many ways uh, jesus will later say i am the door if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and, and will go in and out and find pasture. It would really help my sermon if it referred to the entrance of the temple when he said that. But his analogy is to the, the Middle Eastern shepherd, a sheep pen, where the shepherd would lie across the entrance at night to protect his sheep. Uh, it's still a good point uh, that there is one way and Jesus is the door salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind 
by which we must be saved. One way into this courtyard. It was an open space, as we discussed, quite a large open space, where ordinary Israelites would go to worship. Now, at this point, I'm not exactly too sure what that worship would look like. Did they all pile in and sing? Uh, perhaps listen to Moses talking about the law. Uh, clearly not in one go, there were far too many of them. In the time of the temple, then, that, that may have been the case, although it's not completely clear. They, they certainly couldn't all do it in the same time. So I imagine if this is the case, there would be this constant coming and going to the tabernacle courts. But interestingly, we read in Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Sorry, I don't know if I read that properly. Did I miss a line? My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. This, uh, this is smaller to read from this, this, this phone that I'm using. But it's generally assumed that for some reason the writer of the psalm was uh, away from Jerusalem and had this longing to be there. Now, of course, it doesn't stop him praying, doesn't stop him singing. The psalm is in effect a, psalm, a song. But his soul yearns, faints for the temple. And in doing so, because the temple in Jerusalem was in a, in a, in a special way where God was pleased to dwell, his heart and his flesh want to be there. Uh, not just for the temple, but for God. His passion for God is alongside his passion for God's people. The great 19th century preacher, Star Charles Spurgeon, uh, writes, uh, Earth contains no sight so refreshing to us as the gathering of believers for worship. Across the country, now it's wonderful. It's precious, it's important that we're part of it. Yes, you know, now as back then, you can pray to God any time, any place. But meeting together with God's people is special. They knew God wasn't confined to the temple, but there was a special presence there within the Holy of Holies. And this guy had a desire to meet with his brothers and sisters and, of course, to meet with the living God in those temple courts. As far as the tabernacle went... They were never that far from from the middle of the camp. Later in the uh, later in the land with, with the temple, uh, some would live close to Jerusalem, others would live farther away. But that longing was there to meet with God in those temple courts. Now, if we ask the question, does the church replace this courtyard? It's a bit more complicated. Than that, The tabernacle and the temple emphasised the presence of God among his people, where God dwelled with man. And it was tied to a land, tied to a building. But it's not anymore. Buildings are helpful as they, they are. Um, sorry, buildings are as, as helpful as they are, but they're not the place that God dwells. Uh, but when we come together as the body of Christ, that is where... God dwells. 1 Peter 2 verses 4 to 5 put it like this. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It's people, not bricks, that make this spiritual house. That's why it's important to belong, uh, to, to worship in these courts of the Lord. Then thirdly, we see the um, oil for the lampstands, verses 20 to 21. So we've been building furniture. We've been putting up tents. We've put up a barbecue in the courtyard. Now I struggle to stick with the theme a bit at this point, perhaps sorting out the lighting and for this we move back indoors. We read, Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light, so that the lights may be kept, and the lamps may be kept burning. I learned that uh, pressed olive, I never really thought about it before, but pressed olive was 
<coughs> literally just that various weight would be put on the, your bucket or whatever uh, and um, either the weight did the work or perhaps uh, an olive press would gently squeeze the olive out rather than being crushed which made it cloudy and this would uh, result in a clear olive oil which burns with very few fumes now i've no idea how quickly this oil burns now, obviously they have a little wick in it which would need replacing i imagine but those lights would need attention i can imagine there would be uh, an industry behind this uh, collecting the olives bear in mind they were moving through the wilderness uh, then pressing them making sure for this constant supply to feed these lamps there would be might we say an urgency about it so the product and the making of it was important with the need for purity vital you couldn't use crushed if it was unclear it would be discarded right here at the center of the tabernacle is a reminder that purity of the product was important because the people of for the people of god because god had commanded it Purity will always be important. Psalm 119 verse 9 tells us how can a young person stay on the path of purity or keep his way pure by living according to your word. Seeking to live a pure life doesn't just happen any more than pure olive oil just suddenly appeared. It needs attention. It's not easy because we, we fail so many times. Spiritual growth, spiritual maturity doesn't just happen. What did the Apostle Paul say in Romans 17? Nonetheless, uh, in 17, he said, For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And that's the battle, isn't it? It takes time. It takes effort. We read, we pray, we worship, we meet with these people of God with the people of God and what is the key as the psalmist says by living according to your word it will be a fight it will be a fight every day until that last day you shut your eyes for the last time and open them in glory but what a fight a fight that is worth it the next thing we learn from this is the presence of God with his people now the whole tabernacle has said this but we see it in these lights it was such an important job to keep these lights topped up and burning i think i think they were lit all the time that seems to be debated because it talks of evening and morning uh, so i might be wrong but certainly at night and in, we read in the tent of the meeting outside the curtain that is front of the testimony aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before the lord from evening till morning Aaron and his sons, at this point four of them, soon to be two, but it's another story. Uh, but this would involve all of his descendants. I'm sure they had roles, rotors to do it, but the tiredness might become a real battle. But this was the first biblical command for the priests. Now, I've never done a night shift, although in the early days of my time as a postman, I'd be up at 3.30ish and my first thought was always how long till I retire. Um, but I reckon this is a night shift, isn't it? I love Psalm 134. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. It's a wonderful thought that as you fall asleep, others elsewhere around the world are awake and Christians will be worshipping God, especially on the Lord's Day. And that ministry of serving God was the act of worship throughout the night now did it involve anything else did they sing um i don't know uh, but god was there uh, shining in the darkness and worshipped through their service of him we often think of what we do here on a sunday morning when we sing as worship but worship is so much more than that we read in romans 12 therefore i urge you brothers in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Offering our bodies in the sense of laying them on an altar. 
Dust in the pews is worship. Vacuum in the carpet. Chatting to a new visitor. It's all part of our worship of the light of the world, Christ. But we see something more. Remember, Moses had to make this exactly as he was shown because it reflected a heavenly reality. And in Revelation 4 verse 5 where John gets his view in his vision of, of the throne room of heaven. Remember, we don't need a tent now. We don't need a temple. He sees uh, at the beginning of the chapter. Uh, sorry, we read at the beginning of the chapter. After this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And as he goes through, it's an incredible, awesome chapter where we read in verse five before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Now, many people have asked, who are these seven spirits? But it's the sevenfold spirit of God. And there's other places we could go to to learn about that. But perhaps this perfect spirit of God blazing is all his glory amidst this ceaseless worship. And here in the tabernacle, we see just a glimpse of that heavenly reality where before the throne of God, the spirit of God shines his light, consoling the weary heart, creating the heart anew, sanctifying the soul, stirring people, making them more like Jesus. The light in the tabernacle barely left the tent, I imagine. Could you see it from outside? I don't know. Uh, but that to which it points is shining throughout the world as it has done, as he has done since Pentecost, filling his church, empowering his church. That's why we read at the end, this is to be a lasting ordinance among the Israelites for the generations to come. There's no more temple. We are the people of God and the spirit of God will burn within us forever. Let us worship him with our whole heart. Now we're going to sing uh, Psalm 8. But first we'll pray. Uh, our gracious God, we thank you once more for this incredible imagery that we've seen today. In many ways, a plain tent, unusual perhaps, but where it points, the Lord Jesus Christ, truly amazing. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. For the glory of your name we pray. Amen. i yeah.